Okay. Welcome back after the break. So before we went uh, for our break, we were looking at uh, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 3 to 30. And we were looking at, uh, you know, God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. This is something also the great I am uh, thought in his mind was a completed thing that would uh, he would accomplish. Uh, that we would be those those who um, choose His Son, those who believe in the Lamb of God, will be conformed to the image of the Son. So we were talking about uh, predestination. Uh, you know, if uh, uh, and I I just uh, posed this question saying that did God choose some uh, who would be destined to be His sons and daughters, be His children, and some to be destined to hell, uh, to be children of Satan, so to say. Um, because that is kind of a big controversy uh, that is in the theological circles about uh, predestination. And uh, I asked the question, is God partial? And we said, uh, no, he's not partial. Uh, where do we look at it in uh, scripture that God is not partial? Uh, we look at it in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, where it says, um, uh, for um, there is no partiality with God. Okay, that's in Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 says, The great and mighty and awesome God uh, who does not show partiality. And also we read in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, uh, that God is not the one to show partiality. So there are many more scripture references just uh, uh, stating a few of them. So we know that God is not partial. Uh, and we also know that God, when he created us, he created us in his image and his uh, likeness. He had given us, uh, you know, the free moral will to choose. He created us free moral beings. And how do we know that? We know that from the very fact when he created Adam and Eve that, you know, uh, you know, he knew that uh, uh, what they were going to choose. They were going to uh, choose to disobey him, to eat from that uh, tree. God already saw it. He knows the choices that uh, he's going to make. So if um, God was someone who, uh, you know, uh, did not give us the free moral will to choose, then he would have, uh, you know, stopped uh, Adam and Eve uh, uh, because that would kind of, uh, you know, this uh, create a whole, uh, uh, his whole plan. Uh, what he created to be perfect, to become imperfect. And I'm sure God would not want that uh, to happen. Just like if you create a model or you create, a, 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 you're painting a picture, you wouldn't want somebody to come and throw paint or splash paint on it or, uh, or break it or, uh, you know, throw water on it. Uh, you will guard what you, your project, what you are doing very, uh, 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 you will guard it so that, you know, nothing will damage it. And I'm sure God would have done things, taken steps to uh, protect what he has created perfect, what he had planned. Uh, but here seeing that God has given man the free will to choose, um, you know, uh, shows us that, uh, you know, it's uh, he did not make the choices for us that, uh, you know, we make the choices, uh, but he knew for new who is going to make what choice. OK, so it's not that uh, he decided for us. It's not that he decided who's going to who will choose him, who will not choose him, who will be in heaven with him and spend eternity in heaven with him, who will spend eternity in hell. Uh, but uh, this is something that he he saw for new who is going to make what choices, who is going to choose him, who is not going to choose him. He also knows the choices that we are going to make in the future, even before we know the choices that we are going to make because he's God. Um, so he did not make the choice for us. Okay. He foreknew our choices and he decided beforehand that those who make the choice of choosing him, choosing his son, believing in his son, uh, that they will be conformed into his likeness. So in time, uh, you know, uh, this happened even before time, but in time, even as we make the choice to believe the Lamb of God, uh, we now become or, you know, the children of God because we are justified. And because we are justified, we uh, are conformed to the image of his son and we will also be glorified. Okay. 
any uh, questions, any doubts uh, before we move ahead? Any questions, any doubts? No questions? No questions. Okay, so we'll move ahead. Um, and we were, we are looking basically, so uh, what did this great I am uh, complete even before it began to unfold in history? Uh, he also, we, we see that uh, he also decided that, uh, you know, uh, that we will have the spirit of sonship or the Holy Spirit will confirm to us that we are sons and daughters uh, of God. Uh, so we see the role of the Holy Spirit in the work of redemption. Uh, in the work of anointing Jesus, uh, even as he went about preaching and teaching, empowering him to do mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. He is also somebody, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who is God himself, uh, also, uh, you know, raised Jesus back from uh, the dead. So we see that the Godhead had a complete plan of redemption in their minds. They knew who is going to do what. They knew that the Son of God is going to be the Lamb of God, that he is going to die on the cross and redeem mankind back to himself. They knew what uh, is going to happen for those who are going to choose um, the Lamb of God, that they'll be the sons and daughters of God. They will be the, uh, the family of God. They will be adopted as sons and daughters. And they would be conformed to the image of and the likeness of Jesus Christ. Christ. Um, uh, we also know that uh, in, the, in the Godhead, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, the plan had already been made and completed that the Holy Spirit uh, will, um, you know, um, uh, assist uh, Jesus in his mission of redemption. He will anoint him, empower him to do science, miracles and wonders, raise him up from the dead. And it's also the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, who says that I will be the spirit of adoption for those who will receive the Lamb of God and the Holy Spirit uh, kind of saying that I will bring them into our uh, family. So we read this when we studied about uh, the Holy Spirit in Doctrine Foundation on Friday uh, from Romans chapter 8. Um, verses 14 to 17, we read this, that those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. And we also read in this uh, verse 15 that we do not receive a spirit that makes us, uh, uh, you know, subject or uh, slaves to fear again, but we received a spirit of uh, sonship or we received a spirit of adoption uh, by which we cry, Abba, Father, and the spirit himself uh, testifies to us. So the spirit himself witnesses to us that we are children of God, that we are hairs, hairs of God, joint hairs with Christ, um, uh, you know, um, and we would be glorified together within Christ. So we see here that uh, the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in the work of uh, redemption that began at a, you know, a point of time in history, but it was already completed a plan of uh, redemption, who will do what in the God it had already been decided plan and was already a completed thing even before the foundations of the world. Now, uh, the other thing that this, uh, the great I am uh, completed even before it unfolded in history was the book of um, life. Okay, so even before uh, we were born, even before we made a, a choice of, of choosing the Lamb of God, uh, believing in him, receiving salvation, uh, God already knew who will make the choices. And hence, our, our names were already written in the book of life, even before uh, you know, we were conceived in our mother's womb, even before we were born, even before we made the salvation decision, the day, the minute we prayed, even before that, you know, our names were already written in the book of life. And how do we know that? Uh, we read this uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the first hour of our class from Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. I think John Paul read it. It says, all who dwell on earth will worship him, 
whose names have uh, whose names have not sorry all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so those who do not choose the lamb of god their names would not be written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so the book was written uh even before the foundations of the world our name was written in it even before the foundation of the world uh, we can read this again uh, we saw this in revelation chapter 13 verse 8 we can also see this in uh, scripture in revelation chapter 17 uh, verse 8 can uh, somebody read was chapter 17 verse 8 of the book of revelation please Revelation chapter 17 was 8 The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition and those who dwell on earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is Thank you so here we see that you know those who do not choose uh, uh the lamb of god their names will not be written in the book of life and this was the book of life from the foundation of the world so in from the foundation of the world those of them who have not chosen the lamb of god god know he will knows who will not make the choice their names are not there in the book of life uh those who made the choice our names are written in the book of life that was there before even the foundations of the world okay so what are the other things that the great i am completed even before it began to unfold in history is that he prepared a kingdom for his sons and uh daughters so the god had already decided uh you know uh, would know who would choose and receive the lamb of god and he decided that those who choose and receive uh, the lamb of god would be brought into the kingdom to inherit the kingdom and be heirs and joint heirs in the kingdom we read this in matthew chapter 25 verse 34 can one of you please read matthew chapter 25 verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world thank you so here it says that you know the kingdom of god was prepared for them from the foundation of the uh, world so those of us who have uh, uh, you know been um, accepted the lamb of god will inherit the kingdom and be heirs and joint heirs of the kingdom this was something that god decided everything uh, before even the foundation uh, of the world okay so all of this was uh, what i mentioned and everything else that we read in scripture we just mentioned a few here was something that was done and completed in the mind of the great i am uh, everything from the beginning to the end the end from the beginning everything was just completed in the mind of uh, uh, the godhead um, but we see that it was uh, hid in himself as a mystery uh he alone knew the plan uh and he alone knew what would unfold uh but he would uh, you know reveal it progressively to the church so we see that uh, uh, all of this was a mystery uh, all of this was just a, a plan thing a done thing a completed thing in the mind of god even for the foundation of the world was a mystery a secret that was there only in the god head uh but we see that god revealed it progressively uh to the church and who is the church us believers yes us believers so all of us you and i part of the church uh and god is uh, you know progressively revealing it to us as uh in different points of time in uh, history okay so this is all that happened even before the foundations of the world even before the world created so all what we have spoken uh what i've shared so far is all that was 
done, uh, or thought of, uh, decided, uh, completed thing in the mind of God even before the foundations of the world. Uh, and then we see the beginning happening uh, and how did God create everything? By his word. By his word. Uh, we've uh, studied already this. We've learned this. Uh, Psalm 33 verse 9 says, He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood uh, fast. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. We already looked at this verse. Uh, we studied this. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Everything that we see uh, 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 or uh, uh, you know, visible, invisible, everything was um, uh, created by his spoken word. And uh, who created the world? Who created the world? God, yes. So when we talk about God, who who do we? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, we see Trinity together in action when they created the world. We've already studied this. Uh, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, they work together um, in creation. Um, we also read this uh, in John chapter 1, verse 3, uh, that the Word, who is God, uh, everything was made through him, nothing was made that, has, uh, that was made without him, nothing was made that was made. So it was not just God the Father, but it was God the Son uh, as well, who was there uh, in creation. How do we know this? John chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 we studied about this uh, you know in a doctrinal foundation systematic theology for by him uh, all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible all things were created through him and for him so we see that God the Father God the Son uh, uh, which I just uh, uh, quoted from scripture John chapter 1 verse 3 Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. This is something that we already studied about, uh, you know, Jesus being part of creation. And also we know that the Holy Spirit was there uh, when uh, the world was created. Psalm 104 verse 30 says, you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the uh, earth. Okay. Uh, and we also know in Genesis that um, the earth was formless and empty and the Spirit of God moved, was hovering over the water. So uh, we know that, uh, you know, the the Godhead, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit together, uh, you know, uh, worked in creation. Okay. And we know that the invisible attributes of God are seen in um, uh, creation. We already studied about this um, uh, in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so they are without excuse and I I have explained this verse when we were studying it in the previous um, uh, chapters okay um, so we see that creation is an in, uh, we, in, in creation, we see the invisible attributes of God, uh, just as the work of an art uh, is an expression of the artist, or, um, you know, um, when a, a, a player, uh, an athlete displays his skill, it is an expression of him being a, a good player. So also create in creation we see that God is uh, his being expressed himself God expresses himself in creation or creation God has uh, expressed himself uh, the invisible attributes of God that is his eternal power his infinite infiniteness his wisdom his life his light all of who he is is expressed in creation and I just uh, read that from uh, Romans chapter 1 verse uh, 20. So we see um, uh, God's limitless, unending, infinite power uh, was released in um, creation. We also know that he, and we also learned that he upholds all things by his uh, 
word. We read this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, we've looked at this, we've studied these scripture passages, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So God holds, he not only created everything by the power of his word, but he also upholds all things by the power of his word. So the entire universe is being upheld by the power of his word uh, and God's powerful word is still at work in the universe. So after God created uh, everything we see in the world, who did he create? Who else did he create after he created everything that we see in the world? Who did he create? Man. Thank you. He created man. He created man in his image uh, to be part of his own family. Uh, but we see that Adam and Eve sinned and plunged the entire human race into sin. They became um, slaves of Satan. Uh, they were subject to his rule. And we see that everything that God created perfect, you know, uh, went into moral decay and uh, corruption. Now, did this surprise God? No, because he already knew. Thank you, John. Uh, it did not surprise God. He was not taken up by any surprise. Uh, God already knew it. Um, and he let it be for some time because he knew what is going to happen. He knew he's going to unfold his plan of redemption. Um, you know, he knew that all of this will be delivered from bondage, from corruption, uh, from being subject to Satan, uh, back to himself. Okay, so we uh, read in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 23, that all of creation was subjected to futility, uh, and creation itself is groaning um, for a redemption, um, and creation itself will be, in verse 21, will be delivered from bondage of corruption uh, into the glorious liberty of the children of uh, God. Okay. And then we see that uh, God uh, unfolding his mystery of uh, his plan of redemption, uh, the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity became the son of God. Uh, we, we studied this in uh, John chapter 1, verses 14 and 34. Can somebody read was uh, John chapter 1, verse 14 and 34, please? Uh, John chapter 1 verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth thank you and uh, verse 34 also John please verse 34 and I have seen and testified that this is the son of God Thank you. So here we see, we're studying about uh, the topic, Son of God. So here we see the word becoming flesh um, and uh, coming from the Father, uh, full of grace and truth. We have seen and testified that he is the Son of um, God. Okay. And we also see that uh, this great I am, the second person of the Trinity, who is God himself, limited himself to becoming a human being. Uh, we read this, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35. I read this in the beginning of our class. I think, uh, I think, Siddhikenu, I think, read it. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So Jesus is uh, uh, the Son of God. Uh, he's also referred to the, uh, the other terms of Jesus that we see in the, uh, in the New Testament is he is the last Adam. He's the second man. He's the heavenly man. Okay, so... Uh, the first Adam is uh, Adam who is created. Jesus is the last Adam. And we know that Paul draws a distinction between the first Adam, the last Adam, the first Adam, uh, because of the first Adam, sin came into the world. 
because of the last Adam, a uh, sin uh, got uh, was conquered. Uh, you know, um, the first Adam uh, that uh, you know brought death. The last Adam conquered death and uh, uh, brought eternal life. Um, and the first Adam plunged all of us into sin. The last Adam, you know, restored us back to our original position uh, of uh, being sons and daughters, of being heirs and co-heirs of God's kingdom, uh, of being uh, people who are to manifest his glory. So wherever we read the first Adam, the first man, the natural man, it's referring to Adam who God created and wherever we read in the New Testament, the last Adam, the second man, the heavenly man, it's talking about um, uh, Jesus Christ. And we read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 and 47 to 48. So can one of you please read 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 45 and verses 47 to 48. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Verse 47, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as was the first man, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man so also are those who are heavenly. Thank you. So here we see that the first Adam was a created being. Uh, the last Adam was the incarnate God, God becoming man who walked as a son of God. Um, uh, and the first Adam, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, was of the earth. The last Adam uh, uh, is uh, or the, the first man was of the earth. The second man was uh, from uh, the Lord from heaven. Uh, the first man was of the dust. The second man or uh, the last Adam uh, was a heavenly man. Um, and because uh, we are uh, belonging to the first man and we go back, uh, we die, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, the consequence of sin is death. But because of the last Adam or because the second man, uh, we receive eternal uh, life and we become those who uh, are, uh, you know, our position is, is in heaven uh, just as um, the heavenly man just as uh, the last Adam, just as the second man is from heaven, so also we who believe in him uh, would also, uh, you know, be in heaven with him. Okay, so these, that's, that is what these uh, verses are telling us. Okay, so the first Adam, the last Adam, uh, the first man, the second man, the natural man, and the heavenly man, that is a comparison between uh, Adam and uh, Jesus Christ. The first man failed, he sinned, he lost everything that was given to him. Uh, we see that the second man or the last Adam obey, or the heavenly man obeyed God. He was without sin. Uh, he recovered everything that the first man had lost. Okay. Uh, the first man is a natural man. He is earthly, but the second man uh, is heavenly, he uh, lives above, he came from above, and so also those who believe in him uh, will belong to where he is, that is in heaven. Any questions about this so far? Any doubts? No? Okay, so we'll continue. So we see that uh, at point of time in history, uh, the Son of God, uh, you know, uh, the incarnate God became a man. Uh, uh, the Son of God came to reveal uh, the Father. Uh, we read this in John chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, no one has seen God, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So we, we looked at... Uh, Sorry, the meaning of this word bosom, uh, that, uh, you know, Jesus was very intimate with the Father uh, and he came uh, to reveal the Father to us. We also see that the Son of God, uh, 
the incarnate word, the eternal word who became man uh, was the exact representation or the exact image of the father. We studied this in uh, Christology in the first few lessons. Um, uh, and uh, we see even Jesus testifying to this uh, in John chapter 14, when Philip uh, asks Jesus, show us the father, and that is sufficient for us. And Jesus tells him, uh, you know, Philip, I've been with you so long, uh, yet you have not known me. Uh, and then uh, Jesus makes a statement, he who has seen me has seen the father. Okay, so we see that uh, Jesus was the exact image. That means he came to represent the father in all his nature uh, and what he does. Okay, uh, we also read this in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, we also see that the Son of God walked in the intimate presence of the Father. We studied what is the meaning of uh, uh, the bosom of the Father in John chapter 1 verse 18. Uh, John chapter 10 verse 15, uh, Jesus says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So we see that uh, the Son of God uh, you know, came to reveal the father. We also see that he was very intimate uh, with the father. Uh, he walked in the intimate presence uh, of the father. Uh, we also see that the son of God rested in the father's love. Uh, John chapter 3 was 35. Can one of you please read John chapter 3 was 35 and uh, someone else can read John chapter 17 was 24, please. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Thank you. So here uh, Jesus is testifying that uh, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. And we see that the love that the Father and the Son shared was even before the foundation of the world. We read uh, the verse uh, uh, that attested to that. Uh, John chapter 17 was 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. Thank you. We read this verse again uh, before a couple of times and we see here that, uh, you know, the father and the son uh, shared uh, an intimate relationship. There was love between the father and son and it this day, their love was there before even the foundation of the world. We also see that the Son of God walked in total obedience um, to the Father. We see that Jesus is saying in various places that, um, you know, I've come to do the will of the Father. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish um, his work. Okay, uh, we also read this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 and 9. So can one of you please read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 and 9? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 and 9. It says, then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. So here we see that, you know, uh, Jesus Christ came to do the will of God, the Father. Okay, and he also walked in total obedience to the Father. He came to do the Father's will. He accomplished the plan of redemption, of salvation, by taking on the sins of the entire world and dying on the cross and becoming that perfect lamb. Uh, are all of you following with me? Am I too quick, fast? 
or are able to understand? Please share your uh, comments. Am I too fast? You are able to understand? Yes, Pastor, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, thank you, John. Only one of you. One feedback. Anyone else? How about the others? Are you all able to follow through? Okay, thank you, Silatuli. Okay. Okay, so we'll continue. We're looking about uh, who the Son of God is, uh, how, we, uh, you know, the Son of God is the incarnate word, the eternal word, and, uh, you know, that he limited himself to being a human being, and how did he walk here on earth? He, uh, we see that he came to reveal the Father. Uh, we also see that he walked in the intimate presence of the Father. Uh, he rested in the Father's love. He came to do what the Father's will was, that he lived in total obedience to the Father. We also see that the Son of God walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know that uh, Jesus gave up, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, he refrained from uh, using the attributes of God of being omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Uh, he became a total, uh, you know, uh, in likeness of total human being. And uh, all of the miracles that he did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see this in scripture, uh, you know, just after he was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, we see that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into Galilee. We also see that uh, he did mighty signs and miracles to the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 38, um, we see the uh, disciples uh, attesting to the fact that and saying that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, And we also see that the Son of God destroyed the works of the uh, devil. We, we just uh, saw that in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Uh, he delivered all who were oppressed by the devil. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the uh, devil. We also see that uh, the demons shivered and trembled and uh, fled at the very name of Jesus, the very presence of Jesus. Uh, James chapter, sorry, Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, um, you know, and suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus uh, the Son of God, have you come here to torment us before uh, the time? So we see that, uh, you know, Jesus was casting out demons and uh, the demons uh, saying that, what have we to do with you, Jesus? And they referred to him as the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 3, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 11, when uh, Jesus was, uh, you know, casting out the unclean spirits, uh, we see that the unclean spirits, whenever they saw Jesus, they fell down before him and they cried out saying, you are the son of God. See that uh, the demons trembled before uh, the son of God. We also see the son of God uh, withstood every temptation. Um, and we see that when Satan questioned his sonship, uh, Jesus was over. Uh, who overcame um, all of those temptations by, uh, you know, uh, by declaring or quoting a scripture. And uh, we read Jesus' temptation in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 3, we read that when the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And in verse 6, he says, uh, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, he shall give his angels charge over you and uh, uh, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against her. So, so we see here that when Jesus was tempted, uh, Satan was directly questioning his sonship uh, uh, of him being the son of God. Okay, Did Jesus declare that he was the son of God when he lived here on the earth? Yes, no. Did Jesus declare that he was the Son of God when he lived here on the earth? Yes. 
Yes, Jesus uh, does reveal himself as the son of God in John chapter 10, verse 36. Um, uh, Jesus says, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Uh, because I said, I am the son of God. So Jesus does refer this title to himself as the son of uh, God. Uh, Luke chapter 22 was 70, uh, 70 in Luke chapter 22. He, Jesus, and they all said, you are the son of God. So he said to them, you rightly say that I am. So Jesus, when uh, the disciples said that you are the son of God, uh, Jesus did not, uh, uh, you know, uh, stay quiet or he did not say he was not the son of God, but he says, you rightly say that I am. That means he accepted the title that he is the son of God. Uh, did the disciples have a revelation of him being the son of God? Yes, no. Peter especially, okay. Yes, you're right, uh, Lubega. Thank you. Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 to 17. Uh, Jesus asked them this question. So who do you say that I am? And uh, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living uh, God. And we know that, uh, you know, he just didn't say it out of himself. It was a revelation that was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So uh, Jesus says that, yes, you know, you rightly say that I am the son of the living God, and this is revealed to you uh, by my father who is in uh, heaven. Okay, so we see that Jesus uh, attests, calls himself as the son of God, and also disciples, uh, you know, receive the revelation of him being the son of God, and Jesus um, uh, accepts uh, the fact that, yes, he is the son of God, or he accepts that declaration that he is the son of God. God. We also see that the Son of God completed the work of redemption, uh, the the plan of the Trinity of the or of the of the Godhead that was planned even before uh, the ages of the world or even before time began. Uh, you know, we see that uh, in point of time in history, uh, Jesus did come as a son of God. He did die on the cross. He paid for the sins of the whole world. Uh, he completed the work of redemption. Um, and we know that he alone was qualified to do it because he alone uh, was God uh, who became man. He was a sinless man who could take on the sins of the world and make that full sufficient perfect sacrifice. We know that uh, he not only um, died and was buried, but uh, the son of God was also raised back uh, to life. Uh, we read this in Romans chapter 1 verse 4. And declaring to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness uh, by the resurrection from the dead. So we see that the son of God was resurrected back uh, from death to life. We also see that the Son of God, uh, we just studied in the previous chapters, the Son of God was exalted and glorified with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we read this in Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 where it says, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, in him is in Jesus, uh, all the fullness should dwell. That means the fullness of the Godhead, which he received after he was, uh, uh, he ascended back to heaven. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, for him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we see that um, once Jesus ascended back uh, to the Father, he was glorified with the same glory uh, that is of God that he had even before the foundations of the world, even before the creation of the world. Now, what does all of this uh, mean to us 
okay uh, why are we looking at this title son of god uh, son of god uh, or why did we look at god even before uh, 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 you know who he was uh, even before the foundations of the world we saw uh, what uh, the great i am had uh, you know um, uh, thought and was a completed acts in his mind even before the foundations of the world was laid uh, we looked at uh, uh, you know the beginning of uh, what god did in creation creating us how the son of god who is jesus the eternal word came what he did uh, how he completed the plan of redemption how he lived uh, so what does all of that mean to us okay um, you know it uh, so what do we do how do we act on it the first thing is uh, is that we believe in the son of god uh we believe uh, what he has done on the cross for us uh we know that uh, we studied about uh, his death his uh, resurrection and we studied that he did it all out of his uh, uh love for us okay we looked at scripture passages that talk about this john chapter 3 verse 16 god so loved the world that he gave his only son uh, all those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal uh life uh we also read this in 1 john chapter 4 verses um 9 to 10 where it says in this is the love of god in this the love of god was manifested towards us that god has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him in this is love not that we love god but he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins we looked at this verse we studied this uh, we understood this in uh, when we were studying about uh, jesus christ his death his uh, his uh, uh, resurrection and his ascension and we know that uh, he did all this out of his love for us uh, so what should be our response is we need to believe in the son of god okay uh there are few other responses um, uh we'll just um, stop class here we just have a few more uh, things about uh, what is our response to what the son of god has done or what the i am had uh, planned even before the foundations of the world uh, what should be our response we just looked at the first one is to believe in the son of god we we'll look at a few more uh, maybe in our next class uh, that is uh, next monday um so we'll just pause here and we'll take any questions any doubts that you'll have any questions any doubts well all of this what i was just sharing uh is not there in your notes but uh, i'll just share the pdf uh, uh, copy of the sermon notes so you can have that i hope you enjoyed this study it was quite uh, a good uh, revelation a good study any questions yes john No, I was saying it was a good study. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not my study. It was. I'm just taking this uh, from the sermon notes that uh, Pastor Ashish had preached. Uh, but an excellent uh, study he has done. Any questions? Any doubts? no if not uh, just have one more minute if not we'll end class and well we'll uh, extend this to another class maybe uh, uh, next monday so we'll meet again next monday uh, and i'll see you all on wednesday for uh, for doctrinal foundations okay okay thank you all for uh, joining class so i think there are no questions no doubts Thank you all. I have a good day and a good week ahead. A blessed week uh, and I'll see you on Wednesday for our next class.